Welcome to Constellations, the podcast from Kratos, where industry leaders share their thoughts and experience on the future of space business, policy, and opportunity. If you like Constellations, please support us by giving a rating and review on iTunes. And don't forget to share this podcast online to help our community grow. Welcome to Constellations, the podcast from Kratos. My name is John Gilroy, and I will be your moderator. Our guest today is John Gedmark, CEO and co-founder of Astronus. The startup companies are becoming more prevalent in the satellite industry by the day. Many of these companies provide fresh new solutions to problems we face. In today's Constellations episode, we will focus on how micro-geo satellites improve communication in remote areas of the world. To guide us through this topic, I'd like to welcome our guest, John Gedmark, CEO and co-founder of Astronus. John will break down the advantages of micro-geos and how they help us unlock new possibilities in communication. You know, John, every year technology is getting smaller and more advanced, which brings us to microgeos. Can you explain to our listeners what they are, how they're different, and what advantages they bring? Yeah, for sure. Uh, thanks so much for having me here today. Uh, so first, I think it's probably best to start with a, a good visual representation. A, a microgeo, when we say a microsatellite, what we mean is a satellite about the size of a mini fridge, uh, or maybe a little bigger, a little smaller. And that is in comparison to the traditional behemoth satellites that are put up in, in geostationary orbit uh, that are typically around the size of a double-decker London bus, right? So you can imagine just that size difference alone is a huge, huge difference. Uh, and then there's also the difference of, of how we're using them. So the traditional big satellites, which might cost couple hundred million dollars each. Uh, they're really designed and, and always have been historically going back to some of the earliest days of, of the space age to cover an entire continent with satellite TV channels or now more uh, more commonly broadband internet. A microsatellite, instead, what we're doing uh, is a business model of a, of a individual country by country approach. So each satellite can be dedicated to a small or medium sized country and that means that some of these countries uh, around the world will be able to have their own satellite, dedicated satellite just for them uh, for the very first time. So they're not sharing a satellite uh, with anyone else or, or, or sharing the capacity with anyone else. Uh, and also the cost to them, you know, is more right sized for what they need. So we've seen uh, basically, a, a, yeah, we've just seen a huge amount of interest for this around the world. And also here in the United States, where our first customer is in Alaska. So, uh, of course, not its own country, but... A very similar approach. We, we are going to be putting up uh, and, and launching next year a satellite for Alaska that will be the state's very first dedicated satellite just for Alaskans. You know, when I uh, think of these, these huge satellites and all the complex nature of them, and I think of a smaller satellite, I think of form factor. And, uh, and so what, was it difficult for you to get all that technology into that small form factor? How did you overcome some of these obstacles of size? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, what we saw was that there was a number of advancements uh, over the last, I mean, really 20 years, uh, things like lithium ion batteries, you know, originally these satellites were designed to use big, heavy lead acid batteries. Um, and a lot of the big satellites were not taking advantage of this technology, uh, or, or at least not fully. So maybe they had made the move to lithium ion batteries, but they didn't redesign the satellite to be more optimized for that. Instead, they just used the same uh, battery bay and just put a small, a very small stack of lithium ion batteries in it. And they just had this giant empty, uh, empty cavity. That's just this, this big cavern uh, inside the satellite. Uh, so we had this opportunity with a clean sheet design to really take advantage of some of these advancements. Uh, and that includes the, the battery technology that includes a number of electronics uh, improvements that, in, that includes uh, electric propulsion. So using ion thrusters, which have much, much better performance than traditional liquid rocket engines. Um, and, but yes, the, so so we were able to take advantage of a lot of things that had come before us, but the real technology challenges were around uh, building a, a flexible software-defined radio for space. We knew that was something we needed from the very beginning, uh, and happy to talk more about that. And then also there's a big thermal challenge with something like this. Uh, so, you know, really trying to pack as much capability in a small form factor as you can, then you really end up with, uh, you can have some, uh, some real thermal challenges uh, just with, all the electronics and power amplifiers, everything running really hot. And how do you get rid of all that thermal energy? The sort of the excess waste, waste heat. So, yeah, there were some very real challenges in developing the satellite for sure. 
No, John, when I think of smaller satellites, it just makes it's logical sense. It would take less time to build. And, and you know, with the number of satellites they can put on launch vehicles now, uh, more cost-efficient launches. I guess it's possible. Can you see a scenario where micro geos, they might replace these full-size geo satellites sometime in the future? Uh, you know that the answer is yes, of course. <laughs> of course they do. Um, you know, maybe not literally every application that the big geos are used for today. I mean, sure, there's certainly circumstances where you really do just want and need that continent-wide uh, capability for uh, especially for satellite TV or maybe for some other some other applications, but uh, but for a lot of them, we see the advantages as multiple fold. You, you know, we're you're not just getting uh, these cost advantages, but the speed to deploy something new. So, uh, as you said, you know, it, it is faster. The satellite is so much smaller. You can actually you can assemble it in a few months, not a few years, uh, and then you can add capacity just as it's needed. Right? That's the other primary advantage is just you have this granularity where you can start with one satellite and provide a small and medium sized country just what they need at that time. And they're not paying for anything they're not using, which is, I think, the problem today. And then they can add more cap- capability over time until you have a group of these small satellites, uh, we call it a cluster, that are providing the same uh, effective service as a large satellite. And in fact, is more flexible uh, and more resilient as well. You know, with the big satellite, you really you have all your eggs in one basket there if something goes wrong. So we do see a just a number of different advantages uh, that when all combined, we think it's going to take over a lot of what's being done today with the big satellites. Earlier, you mentioned this concept called a software-defined radio. And um, there's some people who are listening that, that know it well, some people that may be kind of awkward with defining it. Could you maybe give us a little thumbnail description of what a software-defined radio is and, and what's the benefit of even using one? Absolutely. So uh, I think the best way to think about it is that the, the satellite world has been unfortunately stuck in the analog radio age up until very just recently, by which I mean these satellites will have and they'll, they'll have these radio waves going up to the satellite. Uh, they will take in those radio waves and essentially repipe them back down without ever digitizing the signal. It's just stays this analog wave all the way through, similar to how, you know, if you imagine back uh, when people were listening to old analog radios in their homes, listening to FDR's fireside chats. Uh, that that was just an analog wave going directly from whatever microphone FDR was speaking into through the airwaves into their radio and then still analog to the speaker and vibrating the speaker. It was analog all the way through. There was no digitization coming uh, coming into play there that just hadn't been invented yet. Well, unfortunately, in the satellite world, it's been the same way until literally just a few years ago, I mean, which is sort of crazy when you think about it. Uh, and so when you actually move into the digital world from the analog world, you have a huge range of benefits. Uh, it's almost impossible to list them all with the time that we have. It's like moving from, you know, vinyl records to MP3s where you can, uh, you know, you just mentioned all the things you can do with a digital MP3 file, including the compression and all the rest, higher quality uh, compared to an old analog vinyl record. Uh, it's just a tremendous difference. So you get higher performance, you get a cleaner signal. Um, and maybe most importantly for us, you get this flexibility where the satellites can be agile across these big wide ranges of frequencies. And so you can actually put up satellites without having to worry about exactly what, uh, what location they're going to be going to or what area they're going to be serving. And you just dial that in in software um, when, when you need to. Yeah. I was at your website and uh, let's, let's pull up and, and take a look at the whole company itself, Astronus. Give us some background on, on the mission of the company and, and what have been some of your biggest challenges? Yeah, so our, our mission is to get the world online, right? I mean, that is the ultimate goal here. And what about next week, huh, John? <laughs> I mean, that's quite a, that's quite a mission there. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it, it's not a small thing. It, it, it is going to take all of all of our efforts plus all the efforts of all of our, uh, you know, all of our brethren to get to even try and make a dent in it. Because, you know, four billion people not having real broadband access to the Internet is just such a tall order. It, it truly is one of the world's most epic problems. Um, so we're, you know. We're using this country by country approach to have the, you know, to, to try and make a dent in it as best we can. We're really optimized for speed and, uh, and, uh, being able to 
provide so many, uh, you know, additional service that needs it. Uh, as, as soon as we can, again, we can build these satellites very quickly. Um, but uh, yeah, it is a big problem. And it's, in, in our view, it is a first order problem, meaning it, you know, it's really at the top of the list. If you know, you imagine Maslow's hierarchy of needs uh, for a community, getting them reliable communications uh, and, and really access to the world's knowledge that is the internet that is at the top of the list. It allows them to do everything from uh, getting, you know, all the healthcare information that they need to uh, doing telemedicine, telehealth, getting education, being able to take online courses uh, and also being able to be active in their community uh, and in civil life and be able to maintain their safety. I mean, it's, it's really something that just cuts across everything and can really improve people's lives across the board. So it's just an incredibly important mission for us. Uh, and that's, that's why we were so focused on it here at Astronomers. You know, John, thousands of people from all over the world have listened to this podcast. Go to Google and type in Constellations Podcast to get to our show notes page here. You can get transcripts for all 84 interviews. Also, you can sign up for free email notifications for future podcasts. Going to give you a shot to brag a little here. So during this journey of Astronus here, what have been some of the accomplishments that you're most proud of? Ah, great question. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think we are incredibly proud, first of all, to have successfully put a test satellite into space. Um, you know, space is hard and nothing, uh, you know, nothing is given. Nothing, is, nothing comes for free. It, any, kind of, any kind of success comes through enormous uh, hard work. Uh, by and we have an incredibly talented team that I'm, I'm also very proud of uh, that has that has come together to to execute on this mission. Um, but yeah, we we did launch a test satellite. Uh, this was a couple of years ago to basically demonstrate uh, some of our technology around uh, the software defined radio concept that I was talking about earlier. Um, and then yeah, I mean I'd say next step to that is. Uh, we're just very proud to have been selected to provide this service to Alaska, right? And be uh, now the the source by which uh, many hundreds of thousands of people in Alaska will have access to broadband internet. And for many of them, it'll be the first time ever. I mean, you know, there are parts of Alaska that are extremely remote. Um, there are uh, Native American communities there. There are uh, other very remote communities there that, uh, you know, they are going to have uh, broadband internet for the first time. So we're very proud of that deal uh, and and having that opportunity. You know, John, earlier you mentioned 4 billion people still have no internet access. You know, bringing internet to remote parts of the world is something that other companies are trying to accomplish as well. You know, I think there's SpaceX, Starlink Constellation, and, and Google's using the internet balloons to bring internet connectivity to remote parts of Africa. So, so what's the special sauce? What makes your solution better than the others or different from the others? Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, I'll just say, as I said, this is one of the world's most epic problems. I think it's going to take everybody working together and all of these companies, you know, essentially putting as much stuff up in the sky as we can possibly get up there. And and only then maybe we'll have a hope of putting a dent in the problem. Um, the reason we chose the approach we did was we looked at what was the main thing stopping people uh, from getting service today. And if you go into some of uh, the more developing countries in the world, what you find is that, you know, it's not like these people have never, uh, never been on the internet ever. Uh, the problem is that the internet is really only available in a sort of, you know, maybe a, uh, a small city or town that's near where they live and they have to travel for, uh, you know, an hour or more to get there. And then they'll, they could get on Wi-Fi in a coffee shop or something like that. But what they really want is what we have internet, on their handset and, and, you know, all of these, all of these people have, have cell phones. So internet on their phone, wherever they go. But to do that, you need to have a, a low cost way to deploy cell towers out in the middle of really these, these most, the, you know, these very remote areas and connect those cell towers to the internet. Well, we've been talking to telcos all around the world. And what we found is uh, they are happy to deploy cell towers into very remote areas uh, you know, that's no problem. The problem is connecting those cell towers to the internet. You know, it, what we've done in the United States is connect every single cell tower with fiber. Uh, you know, you're, you're running fiber for hundreds of thousands of miles. Um, but that can't be done for less than cost in the, you know, many billions of dollars. It, it's just a total non-starter in a lot of these countries. Uh, and a lot of them have rougher terrain than we have in the United States. I mean, they have much more rugged mountains, uh, jungles, deserts, um, 
and that's just that just adds to it. So you got to find a way to connect the cell towers to the internet, uh, and we found satellite as the as the key solution to solve what we think is the most important problem in the chain. Uh, so that's that's how it works, um, and that's the place where we'll be slotting slotting in to help solve this problem. Four billion people. Boy, that's a kind of a a big picture. And you seem to be a big picture guy here. So let's assume that you're successful with this. So how do you foresee these remote areas utilizing the newfound access? The key word I'm thinking is transformation, you know. What do you think will change most in the areas as a result of your success? Yeah, it's a great, it is something that uh, I think about a lot. And I would really put it into three categories of changes that we'll see. Um, so the first category is there's a lot of people where it'll change their lives uh, pretty substantially for the better. Um, and as, as I said, you know, it gives them access to health information, to, uh, you know, information about what's going on in their local community. Um, it, it will really be this, uh, this great force, this, this, this tidal force that will, that will lift up, that will lift up whole communities or allow them to lift themselves up. Uh, the second category is for some people, it will completely change their lives uh, because they'll be able to take online courses to become, say, an engineer. And if you can imagine how much, you know, a, a, a software engineer located in one of these countries, if you can take online courses and, and you're someone who has that, you know, has that talent and that capability to do that, and you just need access to the knowledge to be able to, to learn those skills. I mean, that's going to be transformational for their, for their lives. I mean, they could make money that is, you know, many times what they would ever make uh, just getting some kind of a, of a local job. And that will be an an enormous driver for good, uh, both for those individuals, but also for their communities. They're going to have all this extra spending power that will be just this great thing wherever they live. The third category is people that I think what we'll find is that the next Einstein or Isaac Newton may be in one of these communities. Uh, and that will be transformational, not just for those communities, but for the whole world to allow us uh, as humanity to have access to another thousand, you know, potential people of that caliber. So that's the third category. Yeah, I agree. It's going to be transformational, I think. I saw a press release with a guy named Dan oh. Golden, and uh, he's kind of a big dog. It looks like there's a technical advisory board that you folks have there. Can you tell us more about on this board, this board, who's serving and, and what are they going to achieve? Uh Great question about the technical advisory board. Yes, we're very proud to have uh, Dan Golden, former NASA administrator, uh, joining as a key advisor of the company. And he has assembled just this magnificent uh, board of technical advisors that have uh, expertise uh, really across every aspect of building a satellite. And and there's a lot uh, that goes into building a satellite. There's, as I mentioned earlier, there's the thermal challenges, you have mechanical challenges, you have software, you have all kinds of uh uh, electronics challenges and uh, and then systems engineering challenges. Um, and he's really just been able to assemble this fantastic group. Uh, we're very, very fortunate to have Dan. Uh, and I'm very fortunate to have him uh, advising us and advising me personally just as a, a great friend and mentor. Um, he's really been very generous with his time and we're, we're very thankful for that. You know, John, if you could get out the crystal ball and look you know, 10 years in the future, it's almost impossible to do, I know. But let's, let's project out 10 years here. What improvements in the world do you think will be a direct result of the work you're doing today? Oh, wow. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think the most important, right, is economic activity and growth in some of these parts of the world where, you you know, people really are struggling with not having Internet access today, right? That is the, uh, the single most important aspect of it. So if we can reduce the costs of, of Internet access uh, and increase the coverage uh, to get all those people online, then you could see huge amounts of econ- economic growth. Uh, and, of course, that, you know, that benefits us all. That benefits the whole world um, as, we, as we see some of these countries really just uh, have a, an opportunity to, to do a quantum leap in their economic activity. A serving an underserved market, that's great. You know, you did a great job here with this interview, John. Our audience is always interested in next-generation telecom satellites. I'd like to thank our guest, John Gedmark, CEO and co-founder at Astronus. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to Constellations, the podcast from Kratos. If you like this interview, please subscribe, tell a friend, and give us a review.